Hello, Senator Lundberg. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Great to be here. I appreciate it. I know you've got a really busy day, so I just wanted to try to get right into it. This is uh, um, our Marcy's Law interview series, Why We Do What We Do. And what we try to do is uh, kind of explore what motivates people to get into the area of advocating for victims' rights and for survivors. Um, and in your case, I'd like to first ask you what motivated you to get into public service in general. You have a fascinating background. We talked about before your award-winning <laughs> broadcast journalist, you're founder of a PR marketing firm, an advertising firm, and uh, thank you. You spent 29, almost 30 years in the Naval Reserve as well before um, getting into the Tennessee um, Tennessee Assembly and then the Tennessee State Senate. Uh, tell us a little bit yes. about what motivated you to get into public service uh, from your background, and then we'll get into the victim's rights part. I don't know if there's a specific one thing that, that prompted me into elected office. Um, interestingly enough, one of my early employees long ago was a young man named Jason Mumpower. Jason was a state representative at the time in Tennessee. And so he would obviously go to Nashville and talk about what was going on there. And I had been active in politically in college and it got my interest up. Then we got involved with a state representative campaign and that individual served for a decade. That seat became open. I thought, you know, I think I'd like to do that. So, and and to me, service, elected service is much like, you know, you talked about my military service. And you, we have an all-volunteer force, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Um, no one is there that doesn't want to be there. And so I looked at elected service in the same way. Uh, no one is here that clearly doesn't want to be here. Uh, now, there are varying reasons, which we could go off on a different political <laughs> rabbit hole, um, but it's much the same in my mind that way. And uh, I have been blessed in, in so many ways, and it's my way of giving back, both nationally and to the state that has given so much to me. Yeah, and um, with respect to victims' rights, I saw that you would, you would uh, publish an op-ed um, this past spring in May after National Crime Victims' Rights Week. Um, and you talked about how you were starting to examine the rights that victims in the state of Tennessee had and how you thought that um, with respect to their rights, they fell a little short in Tennessee and you wanted to see if you could play a part in that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think we fall short, frankly, nationally uh, across the board. Um, but in Tennessee, I spent, uh, well, I have been in service 17 years and 10 years in the state house. Uh, I'm in my now eighth year, I guess, 18 years. Um, in the Senate. I have spent all of those years, 18 of them, in the Judiciary Committee, where we see a great deal of legislation, both on the civil side and obviously the criminal side. Um, and as we go, have gone through that process, I know very well what we do for uh, criminals or purported criminals, the accused, if you want, um, which is fine. But along the way, that's usually one individual. Uh, those criminals, though, also have not just one victim, but usually multiple. And you're talking about, you know, in the case of, let's say, murder, the devastation of an entire family. How many is that? That That's 20 people who are dealing with that situation. And when you start doing the mathematics of it, you realize that there are far more victims. Uh, uh, to crime. Um, and I thought, you know, we we don't have an even balance in Lady Justice on this, and we need to do something uh, to help balance that out. And unfortunately, there are way too many stories about how um, not providing information to victims has created, candidly, more victims. Um, and that's not satisfactory. And the one role we have, I think, as state legislators is where we can to provide that safety and security. So, and candidly, it's a very um, nonpartisan issue in my mind because it's about transparency, it's about communication, it's something government should do openly. So, sorry, long answer to a short question. No, it's it's um, it's it's very important that we you know that we see that there are elected officials like uh, like yourself that actually dig into these issues and see how they affect all of the families that you serve, and you make a really good point that these um, 
you know, that that that, that victims, um, it's not just victims, but their families, especially with respect to homicide cases, the ripple effect through an entire family. Um, and like you said, it, it can kind of build off of its off of itself. There are so many times that once you get involved in the criminal justice system, um, there are cases, for instance, where families are not notified um, of the pending release or, or of an actual release of someone who um, who has been charged with a crime um, who will come back out and reoffend. Uh, and that's something that Marcy's Law uh, affirmatively addresses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, in my little town, and I, I live in East Tennessee, in a town that has about 50,000 people, and it's called Bristol. If you don't know it, Bristol is a town that is truly divided. Uh, there is a street going through the middle of town called State Street. Half of the town is in Virginia, half is in Tennessee. Um, you know, I'll give you an example from, unfortunately, Bristol. A few years ago, there's a young girl, teenage girl um, named Gabby, Gabby Kennedy, and um, her stepfather had been abusing her. And uh, so her mother had taken out a restraining order on the stepfather. So he was released. No one was notified. And um, their outside cameras showed him uh, going to the house where he killed Gabby, uh, the mother, and then turned the gun on himself. Um, those are the kind of stories that, frankly, uh, shouldn't happen especially when we have the resources and it's not manpower. It's just communication to stop those kind of events from occurring. So I think it's something we have to do. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you that um, I know from working with a lot of the people in, involved in Marcy's law uh, for Tennessee and a lot of the uh, victims and a lot of the victim advocates and outspoken uh, ambassadors for victims rights, like Joan Berry Um are big fans of yours and the work and the commitment that you uh, that you show uh, for this for this effort. I know that um, Joan worked um, is working to try to get Marcy's law passed, but before that, she worked with yeah. um, the Tennessee legislature to try to get the first uh, DNA uh, database in Tennessee. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. I am. Um, never told this story publicly, but I'll tell you. Joan Berry and her husband are probably are candidly the reason that I'm still in office. Um, and, and I say that, I hope you've got time because I'll give you the story. Um, probably three years into my first term, it was a DNA uh, bill. Uh, Joan's daughter, Jonna Berry, was killed uh, violently in Knoxville where she was going to school. And we passed a bill at the time to require those convicted of a felony that would get a DNA swab. They would take a little Q-tip, basically, and uh, take DNA from those people, and that way we could track other crimes that had been committed. And uh, so there's the the background on that. Sorry, this is going to be take a couple of minutes, but um. Oh no, please. Uh, my son at the time was probably nine, ten years old, and uh, yeah, there was an election in our town. You know, the local city council and mayor's race and we were out one day and saw the signs popping up and I said well son it's uh, about a year from now we've got to run for re-election what do you think and he said dad I don't think you should do it again you've been gone too long and you're gone too often it's like wow so I went home and I told my wife I said I think we now have one of the shortest political careers because I'm done so and uh and she said why don't you take Nelson that's her son to Nashville with you one day, um, just before you make the decision. I said, sure. And he came up and got to sit through committee meetings so he could see how legislation was debated and talked about. And by chance, the governor was uh, that week going to sign the, uh, the John and Barry bill into law. And so I thought, this is kind of cool. Son's going to see from how bills are written to committees to uh, the debate on the floor and finally signed into law. So we went to the governor's chambers and uh, told my son the story of of the berries and what had happened. And uh, we sat down and the berries were in a, some chairs across from us. And he said, do you mind if I go talk to him? It's like, no, it's fine. He went over and chatted with uh, Joan and her husband for about five or 10 minutes and 
we watched the governor sign the bill and uh, he came back and we went around our business for about 45 minutes. He was really quiet. I said, well, pal, you are awfully quiet. What's on your mind? And uh, he said, dad, you need to come back. This is really important stuff. And uh, so that was, that had a big impact on, on him at nine or 10 years old. And uh, had an impact on me too. So. Well, thank you for sharing that. That really um, is really the definition of this uh, very interview series, why we do what we do. That really um, cuts to uh, the very reason why you're continuing to do what you do. And um, you'd probably be happy to hear that um, uh, Joan Berry was my guest on this um, on this interview series uh, this past summer. And Typically, I'll ask another guest, um, you know, who, who, who else do you think in, in this area, in, in your state, whatever state that we happen to be talking about, um, is important um, to this effort? And um, she said, you need to speak with Senator Lundberg. You need to speak with Senator John Lundberg. Um, and obviously, Senator John Stevens, who's been leading the effort, and um, all of the great people in the House of Representatives and the, and the Assembly and Patsy Hazelwood. But um, And then I spoke with Bonnie from Marcy's Law, Tennessee, and she said, Senator John Lundberg is um, someone you should speak with. Uh, so you should tell your son, Nelson, that that was a day uh, that little did he know the impact um, that it would have um, on all of the great people of Tennessee and all yeah. of the efforts that you're putting together. And, and Joan started, as you know, Hope for Victims. And just um, this past Monday um, was the National Day of Remembrance for Murder Victims. And um, mm -hmm. I saw a great piece where... Um, Marcy's Law with um, Bonnie from Marcy's Law was there with Joan and uh, the Knox County District Attorney, Sharma Allen, was there as well um, and um, commemorating the the homicide victims uh, in, in the state of Tennessee. It was a very powerful, powerful event. Yeah. Um, and, and with respect to um, the bill in um, in Tennessee, could you just tell us a little bit about it passed the House in April, uh, 92 to nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's now in the Senate. Um, could you tell us kind of where we go from here to get Marcy's Law to the next step? You know, I am guilty because I haven't looked in to see the status of it in the Senate. I think Senator Stevens has it. So um, has support. Obviously, he sits on the uh, Judiciary Committee as well and has for a long time um, and well, well respected senator. Um, I don't think Marcy's Law would have vast difficulties uh, passing in the Senate. Uh, and I think there'd be wide, broad-based support, kind of like you talked about in the House. And again, I think that also shows that this is a nonpartisan issue. It's not R&D, it's victims. So, Yeah, that is one of the things that we've realized from state to state, that this, um, especially in the area, of, uh, in the era of divided politics that we're living in right now, this is really an issue of um, that, that transcends politics. It transcends party politics because it affects everybody. Um, so one, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you as a legislator, um, what is helpful to you um, on issues? And with respect to Marcy's Law itself, what is helpful to you as far as continuing the support, continuing the momentum and gaining the momentum and support it needs to actually pass. Well, I'm going to turn your question just a little bit. I'm going to say if if you've got an audience in Tennessee that's that's watching and, and hearing this, how can they help? And I'll be very candid with you. Um, I get probably 300 emails a day. And now if you look at Tennessee, I am in the far right corner, Northeast Tennessee. The emails I get, I get 100 from the Memphis area or West Tennessee. Candidly, I'm not paying attention to them. I'm paying attention to the people in my area. So, And candidly, I don't have the, the breadth of being able to respond to that many emails. So if people know who their state representative are uh, or they know who their senator is, that's who really moves the needle when you can reach out to your state senator and say, hey, this is important to me because of X, Y, or Z. Um, that personal connection makes a difference. And if people say, well, it'll be with all the other emails. No, not, a, not if it's your senator. 
there, there's a big difference there. Uh, and now I'm probably going to alienate all the people in Memphis who email me and say, I'm never going to email you again. That's probably okay. But, um, but it really has much more of an impact for those folks who uh, reach out to your senator and tell them, especially if they have a personal story of why this is important to them. Because the really unfortunate part of this is it's, I don't mean to say it the way it's going to come out, but it's like cancer. Unfortunately, so many people have a personal story like this and share that, put it in your words and reach out to that individual, that senator. Um, that makes an impact. That's that's very helpful from a practical standpoint. Um, when um, Marcy's Law is involved in any particular state, um, they especially the Tennessee group has been doing a fantastic job of mobilizing, um, mobilizing the grassroots and getting them to do just that, which is why it was so successful in the House. And we're hoping it's going to be just as successful in the Senate. Uh, Marcy's Law for Tennessee is uh, Marcy's Law, M-A-R-S-Y-S, -S, Law for TN.com. You can go there to volunteer and, and to get involved. Um, and as far as um, Tennessee goes and the stories, um, one of the things that we're going to be doing leading up to your next legislative session um, on this uh, particular interview series is to continue to highlight the leaders and the people who make it happen, like you and the people for whom you're trying to make it happen. Um, over the next several months, that is what we're going to be focusing on, is the stories and the families and the advocates and the leaders from Tennessee um, and from the different districts in Tennessee um, so that we can make sure that we put as much of a glow, as much of a light on this as we possibly can. Um, and when you talked about the Gabby Kennedy case um, specifically, next month, and I'm sure uh, you're aware of this, is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And mm -hmm. so that's um, we're going to be um, placing a particular emphasis on that as well. Um, now, one, one thing that I wanted to just um, fin finally ask you was... Um, uh, your your definition of leadership. I was I, I did a little bit of research um, on you know what brought you to the Senate and what brought you know what keeps you as a as a leader. Um, when you talked about leadership, and I want to make sure I get this right, comes down to determining the direction, setting the tone, and being the leading example. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I just want to thank you for what you've done um, in this area of victims' rights. It's so important. You do have a lot on your plate. And when you're talking about emails, I will tell you that um, when Joan Berry emailed you about this issue and when I emailed you, it probably took about a minute and a half for you to email back. So uh, I want to thank you for being so responsive to your constituents. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's one of those. Here's the political thing. And I, I tell people this often. And they say, uh, well, what if the governor's mad at you? The governor can't fire me. The speaker of the Senate can't fire me. But the people in my district, they can fire me. I work for them. It's a really easy arrangement. So when they call, I answer, I listen. So, And sometimes the answer I give back, they may not like. So because I'm also going to be pretty candid. Um, uh, but this is also, this, this is important, this issue, not just to Northeast Tennessee, not even just to Tennessee, it's important to this country. So it, it it's deep. It's well, deep. Senator, I, I, I want to thank you. I know how busy you are today, and I know you have a lot to get done before the weekend begins. Uh, I want to just thank you for all of your work. And I also want to thank, and I didn't know that story until you shared it, um, your son, your then nine-year-old or 10-year-old son, yeah. uh, for keeping you in this important work. So thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. And by the way, Bonnie and the team you've got there, they're great. They're wonderful. They're personable and uh, known known her for a long time and just do an exceptional job. Yeah, Bonnie is as good as it gets. We're very, very blessed to have her. Yeah, yeah, you really yeah. are. Thank you so much, Senator. Have a great weekend.